Thank you for listening to Gateway City Church Online today. We hope this message will be a blessing to you and draw you closer to God. Now let's go into the service for today's message. If you believe he's a great God, I think you ought to shout hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Let's lift our hands to him. Father, we thank you for your greatness. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your healing virtue in this room right now. Our bodies being healed, energized, repaired, strengthened, restored. Our spirits being restored. Our minds, Lord, our weary minds, our weary bodies, Lord, strengthened in your very presence. In your presence is life, Lord. In your presence is joy. Thank you for your greatness. Lord, filling every pore of our bodies, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your presence in this room. In Jesus' name, everyone be seated. God bless you. Thank you, worship team. Beautiful job. I'm so... uh, honored this morning to uh, welcome a special guest that I wasn't expecting, and I want you to stand, Joan and your companion. This is Joan Swallow. Apostle Joan Swallow uh, is the widow of Apostle Jay Swallow, and Jay Swallow, Jay and Joan, uh, together in their companion, carry like an unbelievable uh, ministry to First Nations people and beyond, but they are probably um, the leading voices of the prophetic and the apostolic in the First Nations uh, communities, not only here in North America, but around the world. And I'm just so honored to see you, Joan. She's in town for Ed Silvoso's conference, and uh, you're a treasure. You're one in a million. Both of you, God bless you. We welcome you to Gateway. Thank you. (laughs) About 50,000 people could not have known when they went to bed on Sunday night that they would be awakened at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, or 4 o'clock in the morning in the community of Santa Rosa and those areas there. Many of them are people because we have a campus in Santa Rosa. We have a 5,000-square-foot building, offices, and uh, a church of about 100 people gathering there. They all were evacuated. I got a call uh, about 6 o'clock in the morning, pray for us because the whole city is on fire. And you all have been seeing what's been happening in the news. And there are Santa Rosa campus, our campus pastors, their homes, their families were all in the middle of that. Well, today I'm very happy to tell you that every single person in our church is unharmed in the midst of that fire. I mean, not one person lost their life. And you know, there's hundreds that are missing. And, uh, and so in our building, our beautiful campus building, uh, the address of our building is on Coffee Lane. And if you know anything about where the devastation was in Santa Rosa, Coffee Park was ground zero for the whole thing. It came through like a firestorm. They say there was golf ball size embers flying through the valleys just like missiles into the city, just exploding everywhere. And now uh, I think some 5,000 buildings uh, have been destroyed, countless businesses. I was up there on Wednesday, and uh, I got there I got there as soon as I could on Wednesday morning, and it, it was chaos. I mean, the streetlights weren't working. I don't think in a large part of the city they have streetlights. There's traffic everywhere. We, I took our staff to... Uh, uh, to breakfast just to find out how they were doing. They were shaken. You can't imagine how uh, their voices were quivering. And one woman, as we, were, as we were parking the car, they said that they saw one woman just stop her car in the middle of traffic and get out of her car with her engine running. And she just started walking around just crying and screaming. She was losing her mind. I mean, it's like, it's like a bomb went off in that area. You, you can't believe it. I sent Pastor Brad and Kathy to be up with them. Uh, this morning and to be with them. And much to my surprise, in the first service, Pastor Cheryl Miller, who's one of our campus pastors there, she was in the first service and her her daughter Sarah and her grandchildren because everybody's had to evacuate. Now people are asking, what can we do? And the hard answer is, we don't know. First of all, uh, to, to look at our people, our campus members there as some kind of a distribution center for the area is completely out of the question because their lives are destroyed. None of them can get to their homes. Uh, uh, they're evacuated. They're they're quarantined out of the area. By the way, I I mentioned to tell you that I meant to tell you that our building, our campus building, is stands uh, untouched by the fire. Just uh, 
just a block away. Had that fire burned another 10 minutes or had the wind shifted in a different direction, you can't believe how close that fire came. Uh, but everybody's okay and our building is okay, but the power's out and that whole area where we live and minister and, and do all of our stuff, they're all evacuated. So we can't ask our team in Santa Rosa, you know, can we give you furniture? Can we give you groceries? They're still, you know, they're still trying to put their homes and families back together. So, so it's going to take some time for them to rebuild. But thankfully, they're not starting. And, and I, I want us to pray this morning for all the, the thousands of people uh, that have suffered. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad for God's protection over, over our people. But my heart is breaking for uh, that community. We believe that maybe a, a revival, that God wants to bring a revival in that area. So some have asked, what can we do? And the only thing I can think of is that if you want to give on our on our website and on our giving app, we now have a slot for you called Santa Rosa Relief. We're going to receive money. Money would be the only thing that, that we could possibly know for sure would be helpful. We, we don't have a place to put food. We don't have a place to put furniture. We don't have a place to, you know, our, our infrastructure, we can't even get to our building. So if you want to do something to help, I encourage you help the Red Cross and the other great agencies that are helping. In time, there may be an opportunity for us to see what we can do. But if you want to give now for our campus and for the families that are a part of that campus, I'm sure that we're going to be, I'm sure that we're going to be distributing money uh, to those who can't work, who can't afford groceries. We just don't know what the damage is. So if you want to give, you can do that uh, on your envelope at the end of the service or on your push pay app. And I, I thank you for that. And I'm sure over the next few months, we'll have a better idea of, of how we can help and where we can help. But right now, we're just putting our lives back together. We didn't even have a place to meet today in Santa Rosa. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're in a temporary uh, headquarters in our, in our Santa Rosa community. But uh, Pastor Brad and Kathy will be with them. The service is at 2 o'clock today because it's in another church. And uh, the people cannot wait to get their arms around each other. This will be the first time, really, they've had a chance to get back together. So can we pray for that community and, uh, pr- and pray for those that uh, we, we haven't been hurt hardly at all. I, as far as I know, n- no loss or damage within our church, but I know all around it, uh, the power of God uh, is, is needed. So Father, we just pray right now for the people in the Santa Rosa community, some thousands and thousands or hundreds that are missing, uh, 30 or 40, I think is the latest count of those that are confirmed dead. Father, we just ask that you would pour out your spirit upon that community and rebuild. How we thank you for, that you have protected us. And Lord, you've even placed our, you've placed gateway right in the middle of that, Lord, to be a light and to be a help. And Lord, we pray that you'll open many doors for us to help and for us to serve. But Lord, right now, we just pray for those whose hearts are broken and destroyed, Lord, their lives destroyed. We pray that they would look to you, God, as the one that can heal, look to you as the one that can provide and minister. And Lord, that the church would arise strong in that area, be light and salt and bring healing and life, Lord, in that area. We ask this, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your protection. And we ask your blessing on that community in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 All right, let's get into the word of God. Uh, Today, I want to welcome everybody in the sanctuary. And if you're joining us online, Uh, It's great to be together, and if you're in the cafe, wonderful. Today, we're closing out the sixth and final uh, message of our Beyond series. This final message is called Stepping Beyond, and today I want to talk to you from my heart about the sweet spot, the sweet spot of God's favor, and I want to drop a verse into you, and I want it to really land deep in your heart. I want you to catch this with everything. I want you to be like a a big ball of glue right now as I, as I share this verse with you because this promise, this word is for you. It's Deuteronomy 7, verse 14. If you came today saying, Lord, I need a word, I want you to catch this right here. This is the word of the Lord to you. You will be blessed. You will be blessed beyond all peoples. There will be no barrenness among your livestock. Deuteronomy 7.14. Close your eyes, please. Just humor me for a moment. Please, just right where you are. I want this to go deep into your spirit. Let me speak this to you. Hear the Holy Spirit say these words to you. In the midst of your circumstances, whatever you're going through, you are going to be blessed. 
you are going to be blessed beyond all people. This is your promise. The Bible says in Galatians that we are heirs, that we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. The promise that God made to Israel in Deuteronomy 7.14 is absolutely your promise. This is for you. And I declare over you today, and I raise my voice over the voice of the enemy, over the voice of poverty, over the voice of fear, anxiety, every voice that has come into your life this last week or this last year, I break it and I replace it with the voice of the Holy Spirit saying to you, reassuring to you, driving the revelation deep into your spirit until it relaxes you until it settles you, until it causes you to feel total peace and confidence that you are going to be blessed. You are not going to be one that is not blessed. You're not going to do without. You're not going to scratch and scrimp and make do. You are going to be blessed above and beyond the people of this earth. And Father, I just speak over your people right now. The confidence, the reassurance that their labors for you, that their work for you is going to be blessed, that their families are going to be blessed, their children, Lord, our children and our grandchildren, blessed of God. The devil can't have them. He can't touch them. We are blessed. Everyone say, I am blessed. blessed. Say it again. "I I am blessed. Hallelujah. This is our promise. This is our promise. Albert and Jenny, I'm prophesying to you. As you go to that to Phoenix, Arizona, you're not just going to struggle. You're not going to scrimp. You're not going to scratch your way through. You're going to be blessed. The Lord is going to provide for you. I prophesy to young families in this church. I prophesy to people that want to own homes. You are going to be blessed. God is going to bless you, your basket and store. Your roots are going to go down and you are going to be blessed. I prophesy to people that are in leadership and positions of ministry and ministry hasn't been going so well for you and there's tight things and difficulties and there's warfare and there's spiritual attacks and I prophesy to you, a blessing is coming and you are in a test right now and you're in a trial right now, but don't you know, son and daughter, that I always test before I bless. I always try before I bring my approval. And so, be not weary in the time of testing, for I will bring you blessing, and you will see that my hand will release beyond blessing in your life, says the Lord. Hallelujah. I think you ought to say hallelujah this morning. Everyone say, this promise, this promise belongs to me. I will be blessed. It's a sweet spot. And I, I want to say this to us. There's a, there's a kind of a life that you can have, and I see it all through the Scripture, and I'm going to talk about it today. I'm going to describe this life that might be different than the life that you are living right now. It might be, it might be different, because you might be living in kind of a way that you're hoping for a lucky break. It seems like nothing ever goes right for you. It seems like somebody else always gets the promotion, or some... You know, somebody else always gets the breakthrough and you know people that are blessed, but you don't consider yourself, you know, like one of those people. You're not in that, you're, you're not in that crowd, but you can be because there's a life. And if, and if you were to take some steps of obedience and make some moves and reposition yourself and actually believe that there's a place, there's a zone, there's a sweet spot where life can be good. It's not always about failure and It's not always about problems and drama. Some of us are living in constant drama. Everything's like an emergency. Everything's like a total uh, destruction zone. But I'm telling you, I'm, I'm prophesying to you, God has blessing for you. And there's a place in you, and I call it a sweet spot, a sweet spot in life. What's a sweet spot? A sweet spot, there's a definition of a sweet spot, which is a location or combination of characteristics that come together to produce the best result. And I believe there's a place for every one of us where things are working together for our good, that best result. I play tennis sometimes. I used to play a lot. And and I know one thing about a tennis racket. There's a place in a racket called a sweet spot. 
And that's if you hit that ball with that, you come through with just the right swing, and that ball hits that sweet spot, it goes further, faster. And there's a place in life that you can live. It's a place in God. You, you might not be living there. Not many of you are. You could say, I don't know how life could be better. I mean, it's not like life is perfect, but, but I'm blessed. You really are walking in the blessing of the Lord, and others are, you're really struggling. And I believe God wants to move 100% of us into that place today of blessing because there is a sweet spot that is available if we will step into it. We see glimpses of this in the Old Testament. I could show you chapter after chapter of uh, Israel's history and Israel's journey, but I'm thinking this morning of, uh, of how God led the children of Israel through the wilderness. You guys remember this where there was a, a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. They were encompassed with the blessing of the Lord. Everywhere they went, they were blessed. Now, it was important that they wouldn't stray from the presence of the Lord. If they ran off on their own, they did their own thing. You know, you can get out from underneath the blessing of God. You can flee the blessing of God. You can ignore the blessing. You can run away from the blessing of God. Not real smart, but you can do that. But if you're paying attention, you can stay centered in that zone. And they were under that pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. And there was protection and there was blessing and there was provision everywhere they went. Somebody call it the fog, the F-O-G, the favor of God. Because as they were under that cloud, they were in the fog of his presence, just walking in, in the favor and blessing of God. How many could use some fog in your life? You know, some, I'm not talking about San Francisco fog. I'm talking about the favor of God fog. You're in that sweet spot. You're, you're in the right place with your relationship to God, and, and you're cooperating with him. And so on and on and on, we find in the Old Testament these stories of, of how God kept his people. Daniel and the lion's den kept. I'm thinking about our people in Santa Rosa, and I'm going, I can't believe it. I cannot believe that our building is still standing. I drove those streets, brothers and sisters. It's bananas up there. But our building is standing, and our staff, our campus pastors, their homes are standing. It's unbelievable. That does, I'm not talking about a life where nothing bad ever happens because bad things do happen to us, but you can still be in that sweet spot. Even when you're crying, even when you're hurting, you can sense that God is taking care of you, that he's watching over you. Come on, how many understand what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about some fairy tale life, but when you're broken and you're sad and you've lost, but you still know that God is with you, you're in that zone. You're in that sweet spot where God is keeping you and preserving you. Then in the New Testament, we read about pretty much the same thing. And I could show you passage after passage of where Jesus talked about the life that he came to bring. He came and he taught about this life and he died on a cross and he rose again so that we could enter into this life, this life abundant. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about bringing us into a life that is abundant, a sweet spot where what's happening to us is different than what's happening to those that aren't in that, aren't in that sweet spot. We're living a different kind of a life. And as I look at the epistles then, I look at the words of Paul the Apostle, and I say, can I find a place where this kind of life is described? Is this zone, is this sweet spot, favor of God place that we could live, is it really biblical? Can I find it in the epistles? And here I find these words. And you tell me if you think this is the sweet spot of God for you, where Paul the Apostle says, and God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in some things, every once in a while, when you get lucky. Is that what it says? So that in what? All things at what? No, it can't be true. So that in all things, at all times, having all you need. Ladies and gentlemen, if that's not the favor of God. If that's not a sweet spot, I don't know what it is. And if this verse isn't true, let's close the lights right now, shut the doors, let's get out of here and go to a game. Because if this verse is not true, if this isn't real, if this is just fairy tale, make believe stuff, let's get out of here. What are we doing? Let's go help the people in Santa Rosa, at least scratch some kind of a. But if this is true, then it should have our attention big time right now. Because I wish I could tell you that the world 
is going to get easier and easier and easier. But I think that it may get tougher. And we better know how to find the zone. We better know how to live in the sweet spot. Teenagers, young people, listen to me. You have nothing to be afraid of in your future because there is a God in heaven that is able to do this for you. He is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound once or twice in your lifetime. Is that what it says? You will abound in every good work. Let's keep reading. As it is written, at this pace, I'm never going to finish my message. But you know what? I'm just going at my own pace. I'm just, I'm going with it. I'm struck at this promise. As it is written, as it is promised, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, seed to the sower, we're going to talk about seed in a minute, because I wish I could say that there are no conditions on this, but there are conditions. For every promise, there's a condition. And he says, he talks about seed. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of what? Seed and will enlarge the harvest. So seed and harvest. He will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched when the enemy decides to give you a break. Once in a while. Is that what it says? How are you and I going to be enriched when we're in this zone? In every way. So that you will have what it takes to be generous on every single occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I'm telling you, there's a sweet spot. And to be honest with you, I'm living in it. I'm not, I, I'm not boasting. I'm, I'm just saying to you, I have to, I have to think, what are my problems? That doesn't mean I don't have problems. That means that the problems haven't gotten on the inside of me. I have challenges like you can't believe. I have, I have pressures and responsibilities and duties and heartbreaks and letdowns, just like anybody. Only imagine it sort of multiplies as you get with a little bit more and more responsibility in life. The pressure and the responsibility and the potential for hurt and pain, it just grows and grows and grows, right? The more people you know, the more times you can get hurt. The more projects you take on, the more times you can mess up and fail. So I'm not saying there aren't failures or issues or pains or challenges or whatever, but I'm saying I'm walking somehow, I'm walking in a place where I actually believe this. I actually believe this. I'm beginning to taste it and experience it. I got one foot into this. I got, I got just maybe like my last leg just kind of dragging to the back side of it, but I'm in. And I'm living in this zone and I'm fixing to get right in the middle of it. Come on, somebody say Hallelujah. So there's a sweet spot, and, and if, if you want to do better and experience more, I have three steps that you could take from wherever you are that will push you closer into that sweet spot, favor of God's own. Let me give them to you now. If you're watching this in your small group, this is the last week of Beyond, number six. Open your books. Go through the material together. Have a tremendous time. We're going to talk about number one. And that is remember the promises. Everyone say promises. Promises are so powerful. They're so important in life. And we really get ahead and we really move and we really stand on the promises of God. And this verse that we've just read is one of the sweetest promises that I can imagine. Paul is telling us that God is going to bless us, that not only is he going to bless us abundant, that he's going to bless us abundantly in all things, not occasionally, but at all times, and that we're going to have all that we need, and so that we are going to abound. That is an unbelievable, incredible promise for our life. What is a promise? A promise is a declaration or a writing that something will or will not be done. 
giving the recipient the right to expect whatever has been specified. Now, if someone fallible makes you a promise, you're hoping. But if somebody infallible makes you a promise, take it to the bank. 36 and a half years ago, I stood at an altar here in the city of San Jose and made some promises to Kathy Canastracy. It's, it's been amazing, but I'm not infallible. And neither is she. We've done very well. God's helped us. Short time after that, I made promises when we were ordained. We knelt down. We made some promises. Made some promises. I haven't been perfect in keeping my promises to God. But God has been faithful to me. I will say this. I worry about people that make promises that are imperfect. But I never worry about a perfect God keeping his promise. Because God is incapable of lying. He is incapable of failing. And he would never, ever deceive us. If God promises it, it's like we've got to learn to live our life respecting the promises of God. I don't get my information from Bloomberg or Wall Street. I don't get my outlook from MSNBC or from Fox News. I don't, I don't take my cues from media or smart mouth people on social uh, media. I, d- I don't take my cues from that. I'm tapped into... Because I want to live in the zone. I don't want to get just whatever I get from listening to the 12 weirdest voices in my life. That's not how I'm building my life. I'm focused on a higher voice. I'm piped into the scripture. I want to believe it. I want to stand on it. I want to obey it. I want to do my part. And then I want to expect what God has promised me in his word. This is how we live. This is how we go to a kind of a different place in life. That's how we find our sweet spot. It's a declaration in writing that something will or will not be done. And I'll tell you, it's so important. We all, we all uh, those of you that have children, you have a niece, a nephew, a grandchild in your life, you know how a child will force you to make a promise. Not right now. We can't have candy right now. We can't go to the movie right now. We'll go later. And what do they say? Promise? Because they know. They got you. And so, you know, if you're a savvy parent or grandparent, you kind of fudge a little bit. Well, you know, we'll see. Because you don't want to say promise because you know it's going to happen. You know it has to happen if it's a promise. We stand on the promises of God, the promises of his word. Let's dig into this a little bit because in this passage that we just read where God is promising he's going to abundantly bless us and all these things, he's actually pulling from the scripture. He's quoting, Paul is standing on a word. He's pulling from Psalm 112. And in Psalm 112 is this part there where we read where it said, as it is written, they have freely scattered. And Paul starts to refer back to a promise In his Bible, remember, he didn't have the New Testament. So he's standing on a promise from Psalm 112. And if you're ever discouraged, if you're ever down, if you ever need a lift, go to Psalm 112 and find out the 12 promises that God will make to you about your children, your grandchildren, about how much you're going to have in hard times. And if you're facing difficulty and you're scared because the doctor's going to call you on Tuesday and you, you don't know what he's going to say and you're nervous because you're, you have an appointment with your supervisor next week and he's called you into the office and you don't know what he's going to say, you, you, you climb up into Psalm 112. And you see that part where it says, I'm not going to be afraid of bad news. Where I'm going to be steady. I'm going to be solid. I'm going to have, my, I'm going to have everything as it is written. See? And he's quoting from Psalm 112. So what I'm saying to you is you find a promise that applies to your circumstance and you stand on that thing and you expect God to meet your need. That's how you move forward. That's how you, that's how you step into this zone. You, you gotta be a promise respecter, a promise believer, and a promise stander. And let me just bring this point to a cap that I want you to stand on the unfailing promises of God in 
Scripture. That is our guidebook. That's where we draw our strength, not from all the crazy talking heads that don't have any faith in God. They don't even have a Christian worldview. And you're listening to them. You're just sucking it in. And you you haven't even stopped to think, this guy doesn't even know what he's talking about. Doesn't even believe in God. And I'm allowing him to inform my worldview and my faith. Listen, if you want to make it and really stand strong in this hour, you're going to have to be a person that understands the promises of God because it's about to get crazy up in here. And we better know what we believe. We better know what God has said and let God be true and every man a liar. And I'm calling on you right now to make a decision about who you're going to believe. Who's going to be the expert in your life? Who are you going to trust in? Who are you going to believe in? And I'm challenging you to believe the Bible and trust in him because nobody loves you like God loves you. And that guy on TV and that guy at your college campus that's berating you and belittling you, that neighbor, that person, that member of your family, they don't have your best interest in mind, I promise you, but God does. Let every man be a liar and let God be true. I'm going to trust in God. How am I going to trust in God? Let's stand on the promises. Number two, you become a promised person, but then you become a generous person. You got to have a generous heart. That's the second piece of this. Paul gives us clear insight into how we can step into this sweet spot. And he continues on, talks about how we're going to be enriched in every way, generous on every occasion. And so it would be wrong for me. I would love to avoid maybe the topic of money or generosity. You say, oh, here he goes. He's going to talk about generosity. I'm not a scholar of the New Testament if I don't explain this to you. This is God's word, and he tells us, I want you to be generous. I want you, here's how you move to a place where God is able to bless you abundantly at all times. It's generosity. You see, generosity is a quality of our heart. And God has always been after our hearts. I've been saying in our prayer meeting the last two, so I can't get away from it. Yesterday, I was on to it again. I'm trying to change the subject, but God is saying, son, I want the people's hearts right now. I want their hearts. It's not about how it sounds or how it looks. It's not about another law. It's not about another thing. It's not about another pursuit. It's not about another idea. The breakthrough is inside of us. The cure for racism, the cure for poverty, the cure for all of this is not another law or another tax. Or, and maybe those things could be good. But I'm telling you, we'll get the law passed and we'll get the tax and we'll still have racism. Because God is after our hearts. And we'll redistribute the wealth and we'll still have poor people. If poverty is in our hearts and we're not generous. So let them pass laws and maybe that's a great idea. But I'm telling you, my God is after our heart right now. He wants our hearts to change. And that's how the world's going to change. And one of, the, one of the sure signs of a, of a heart problem is an issue with generosity and a, and, a, and a stop and a breakdown in that area. And God knows this, so he challenges us. We don't want to have an attitude of withholding, which is, you know, like is it, it's like we're, here we are having a conversation about the blessed life and this amazing zone, and we're saying, yeah, Lord, give me all the blood. I'm going to prosper. I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to be, all right, now it's time to get, oh, ho, oh, hold on, hold on. I'm not going to be a blessing. I just want to get a blessing. And God says, well, is that really a best, my best investment to, to bless somebody who's not going to bless? So God is looking for us to be generous as well. He wants that cycle to, to move through our lives that's so healthy and so strong for us. And, and he doesn't want us to have an attitude of withholding. And, and it's not just with money. I, money's one of the things, but it's, it, sometimes there's love issues and we're not generous with our love. Sometimes there's honor issues. And we don't want to honor anybody. We don't want to compliment anybody. We want to hold back and make sure. And, or if we do, we'll, we'll preface it. I don't, want it. I don't want this to go to your head, we say. You know, when I hear somebody say that to me, 
I, don't, I want this to go to your head, but I, just, I almost want to say, just stop right there. Just don't even try. Don't, just, you've already ruined it. It's, it's like giving somebody a birthday gift and saying, now, I don't want you to get all, you know, I don't want you to like read too much into this or I don't want you to take this gift the wrong way. Just keep your gift, man. If you're going to give somebody love, if you're, going to, if you're going to tell somebody, Joan, I think your hair looks beautiful today. Don't say, uh, I don't want this to go to your head. It's like, it's like we have a limited number of, of honors or gratitudes or, or compliments. And when we get to the end of those, we're going to die. So we have to be really careful. Like, I'd like to give you a compliment, but I've only got so much of it. I've only got so much love, and I want to be really careful. I, 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 there you are. I, I, I love, I love you. A little hug. And if you're going to hug somebody, hug the dirt out of them. You know what I mean? Like, if you're going to, if you're going to compliment somebody, compliment the cheese. Out. Just go for it. Just go all the way. Be generous. That's your four-year-old kid. You can't overdo love. Come on. And if you're going to give, give. Don't have a withholding ad. Am I preaching to anybody? I think our, would our marriages be a little bit better if we wouldn't just measure it out so carefully? Well, I've only got 47 compliments and I got 60 years to go, so that's... No, there's enough. Just, just overdo it. Oh, overdo your love for each other. I'm talking about generosity. And, and God, when it comes to generosity, he doesn't want us to have a, an attitude of wrong giving. He doesn't want us to have an attitude of withholding. He doesn't want us to have us an attitude of wrong giving. He says, when you're going to give, don't let there be anything weird in your heart. Give gladly, give joy. It's like they give her this, oh, here you go, take it. Happy birthday, whatever, take it. God, do you have to have so many birthdays? Didn't you just have a birthday? <laughs> Take it. Merry Christmas. <laughs> God says, whoa. You're, you're not in the sweet spot, dude. You're way outside the sweet spot. We were talking earlier about the, the FOG, the favor of God, living in the fog. I, I, there's another fog that I, that I don't want you in. I don't want you to give out of the false fog, the counterfeit fog, which has to do with fear, obligation, and guilt. Giving is not something we do to avoid going to hell, to avoid curses. Curses are not good, but we don't give out of a lack of, you know, trying to avoid a curse, and we don't give out of obligation. Well, I don't know, we're all, I guess we're all giving. Or, all right, the people in Santa Rosa, whatever. You know, it, it's got to be Look, I'm in the zone. I'm blessed. There's going to be enough. I'm not going to run out. I'm going to always about. I'm going to, this is what Paul is talking about. It's just going to be a more than enough. I can, I can receive and I can give and it's going to keep coming. That's the zone. That's the, that's the sweet spot. I want to remind you that God is a giver. He's a generous giver. John 3.16 said he gave. He loved so much. He gave from his heart. He loves so much the world, the dirty, sinful, broken, God-rejecting world that he gave. Now, how if we're going to be like God, we're going to have to be givers. The generosity attitude, the attitude of generosity is the sweet spot of our beyond blessings. And let me just finish this message with this third point. The third part of this, if you want to move to the zone, if you want to get to the sweet spot, the favor of God, whatever you're going to call it, that life that the Old Testament and New Testament promises to us, you've got to be a promise person, you've got to be a generosity person, and third, you've got to sow your seed. You've got to get your seed in the ground or you're never going to have a harvest, and that's what Paul goes on in this verse to talk about the sweet spot by reminding the Corinthians of the power of a seed. Now he who, re, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. So he's talking about seed and he's talking about harvest. Now everybody loves harvest, but we got to get the seed thing, right? Or we don't ever get a harvest. So God gives us this 
this way of sowing and reaping. And it's not hard to understand how quickly we could find ourselves in a sweet spot. Let me illustrate this for you. One thing I love to do in the summer is barbecue some, like, some nice roasted corn on the barbecue. Then you get that corn. And sometimes it's so sweet, you don't even need butter. Have you ever had corn that sweet? It's like candy. It's like butter's almost like ruining it. But if you like, you can put butter on it and some salt and pepper. And I'm telling you, it's like I'm actually a little bit hungry right now. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. This, this actually is a seed collection right here. There's a couple of hundred kernels here. And each of these kernels, if they were treated correctly, instead of eaten, if they were treated correctly, if they were planted, spaced out, on a, on a, a farm, watered, protected, and there was some patience... This would turn into 200 pounds of corn. If you, not that you would, but if you took that 200 pounds of corn and took all of that seed and replanted it again, you end up with 500 tons of corn. Now you say, how do I get into a a sweet spot? Let me just make it real simple. Stop eating all your seed. Stop consuming everything in your life that has a potential because you could take some of it. Maybe you eat this much and, and then you take a few bites off this and then the rest goes into the ground and it becomes for, an, for another day. You know that when we give, it's amazing. And we, honestly, we don't talk much about this. This is, a, this is a message that I know many people have gone bananas with. They've gone too far with it. And, I, and it bothers me. But we just read a verse. I got to teach you this verse. I got to teach you what he's saying. He's saying there's power in a seed. And if, you, if you'll stop eating all your seed, you'll have something to invest and sow so that in another season, you get way more. And I've learned in my life, look, if you want to, I believe in the tithe. If you want to try to fight with me about the tithe, too late. You, you can't talk me out of it. You can, you can use all the verses and all that. I can give you 27 verses that show tithing is scriptural. But at the end of the day, if, if it's not in your heart, don't worry about it. Work it out with God. I don't want to fight with you about it. But I, I will tell you that for this lady here and me for the last 40 years, it we used to double tithe. I believe in it so much. We double tithe until we started having kids, and then that was impossible because <laughs> they started eating all my corn. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's, it's too late to talk me out of tithe because we've lived this thing. We wouldn't dream of taking our tithe and going to Hawaii with it. We wouldn't dream of taking our tithe and adding a room onto our house or it's, it's just our lifestyle. We'll, we'll, we do way better with the 90% blessed than with it. So first step is, you know, be a tither. But here's the thing about, here's the thing about tithing. It's not, tithing is not generosity because the tithe isn't yours. God says, bring me my tithe. It's mine. I claim the tenth. It's mine. I'll let you borrow it to see what you're going to do with it. But so if I give my tithe, that's a good thing, but that's not, that's not extra credit. That's just opening the windows of heaven so that now we can start transacting and sowing seed for a harvest. So real generosity is when we go beyond the tithe and we say, all right, I've done my tithe, but now what could I do? to help plant a church or help a community in need or that's another thing people will do sometimes they'll say well you know what I'll do I'm going to take my tithe and I'm going to give it to my brother-in-law because he's having a hard time I wouldn't do that I'd be careful I'd be very careful the tithe belongs to the Lord and there's something about bringing the tithe 
to the house to make sure the house is full. But again, I'm not going to argue that. I have my own convictions on that. You, you do as you like. It's, you're going to answer. But the issue is once your tithe is done, now you're ready to sow and you're ready to give. I want to I bring this message right to where it was when we started. I'm out of time. One thought for you to remember. There is a sweet spot in life. And if you're not experiencing it, you can. It's real. Talk to people that are there. That doesn't mean life is perfect. It just means it's working. It's working. I'm happy. I'm blessed. And I want everybody to be there. And Paul says, believe God's promises. Have the right attitude. And get your seed in the ground. Because if you get your seed in the ground, God's going to bless you. Can we pray? Just bow your heads. I want to ask God to bless. Father, I thank you for this time in our church and this time together that we could be as a church family, Lord, thinking about opportunities to reach out and sow and give. And I'm asking you to do a deep work in our heart. Lord, I don't even, David and Kathy don't even know what they're giving yet. But I'm asking you, Lord, to guide us. And I'm asking you, Lord, to speak to every one of us, Lord, that, that you're touching to give, that more than that, Lord, that you would move us into a zone where there is abundance. There's always enough, even in the lean times, because we've all experienced that, that we just know that there's going to be enough. Father, encourage every discouraged person, everyone who feels like blessing is for everybody else and not for them. Drive home the message, Lord, that they are going to be blessed as they obey you. Thank you, Father. Just heads bowed, eyes closed. I mentioned earlier in the service about Jesus. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. And he came to bring us life. And it's, it's not by studying his principles that you find life. It's by meeting his person. It's by knowing him. He is life. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. Maybe you say, I'm at a place where I, I can't do this anymore. I can't. Life isn't working. I need some help. I need to be saved. I need God. Then I want to give you the opportunity to invite him into your life. Because he'll only come if you invite him. If you're away from him today, if you've never opened your heart to Jesus, I want to give you a chance to do that this morning in this service. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I would never embarrass you but I'd like to pray for you. And if you'd like me to pray for you to come into a, a tremendous relationship with Jesus, you don't know him, you're away from him, but you want to know him, you want to invite him into your life and you want to do that now, I want to pray for you. Just lift your hand where you are and say, Pastor, pray for me. Just, I need that, I need that touch. Thank you, sweetheart, I see your hand. Anyone else, just say, Lord, I want to open my heart up to you. Thank you, sir. I'm so glad you came today. Thank you on the front row, that's beautiful. There's a, there's a fifth one in the back. I love to see that. I love to see people just saying, yeah, that's me. I Thank you, sir. I see your hands, both hands up. Six people giving their lives to Christ today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I remember when I gave my life to Christ. So powerful, so special. So, Lord, I pray right now for these six people. And maybe there's others who didn't raise their hand, but they, I'm talking to them. Lord, do a miracle in their life right now. Come in. Wash away their sins. Break the power of their past and fill them with the Holy Spirit and do it big time, Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you for it. Amen. Everybody look up at me. We're going to say a prayer, but I'd like us to communicate with these six people that raised their hands in this service and let them know that was a brilliant idea for them to raise their hand. That was a, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. If you raise your hand, I'd love, to, I'd love to know your decision, what you decided today. There's a card you heard about earlier in the service that says, I've decided. You take that card, 
Drop it in the offering as it comes by in just a moment. We're going to put a prayer up on the screen. I want everybody to just say this prayer together. We're just going to respond to God's word. We raised our hands. We didn't raise our hands. We're all going to say this prayer together out loud. Here we go. Father God, thank you for the promises of your word. I believe that you are faithful and generous. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. I receive him as Lord of my life, and I make a decision today to follow him into a life of faith, generosity, and abundance. In Christ's name, amen, amen. Amen. All right, now we're going to just have some Holy Spirit worship time, and the service will be over in about three minutes. Pastor Chris is going to come and conclude the service, but right now we're going to wait on you and serve the... uh, Serve the cafe and the family lounge and here in the auditorium. If you're, if you're giving today, some of you are giving digitally. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone that's giving. As you, as you experience this worship song, just let your heart be refreshed and encouraged that you are going to be blessed. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. As we were praying, I just saw a picture of somebody in a cave, like you're in a dark place. And when you reached out to God, the light, became, the light came into that dark place. And I want to encourage you as you reach out and worship right now, just reach out to the Lord and call on him. Say, Jesus, I pray that you will come into my darkness, whatever area that is. Lord, let your light and hope come in right now and warm our hearts. Thank you for your light. Thank you for your love. You are so great. Let's sing this, everybody, together. My God, how great you are. Let his light come in. big laugh offering here this afternoon. Come on, let's just give him praise. Come on, let's praise God. Let's praise him this afternoon for his goodness. It's great to be in the house of God together. Amen. I'm going to bless you in Jesus' name in just uh, three seconds. Before that, though, we have our Inspire Conference this Friday. Come early, 930 is registration. Uh, Park around the front. We're going to be having a full house here. It's going to be a great day. Come in, if you can't make it during the day, come in the evening. We start at 7 o'clock. We're going to have a great, great time. So let's be praying and believe in God for a great service. Those that are being baptized, the families, well, those that are being baptized, go get changed. Put your T-shirts on and meet Pastor John right up here to your right, right after the service. And uh, John will give a little short teaching. We're going to have a great celebration over here. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day, for the power of the seed. And Lord, your word says your seed, you can make it grow. We just speak blessing over every person in this house, Lord, that every need's met. And Lord, your provision is abundant. 
and that we believe and know your word is true. And so I just speak in Jesus' name that this week's going to be a great week, that, for, Lord, families are restored, the seed is going forth, and you're blessing your people. So let's just agree together in Jesus' name for the abundance to be growing, and that, Lord, your faith is rising within the people. And Lord, there's a great day that we're living in, and we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen. God bless you. We'll see you Friday. 7, 9.30, registration. If you need prayer, we have our prayer team up here that will be ministering to one another. Come on up here if you need uh, any additional touch with the Holy Spirit. God bless you all.